for 3,000 years, the fields and farms of Britain have been growing food. 3,000 years of continuous production and fertility. But Britain is a small country with a large population. And to get the maximum yield from his limited acres, the British farmer, through the centuries, has had to develop and practice the most intensive forms of cultivation. Machinery and science are at hand to help the modern farmer, but these are only aids to better farming. The secret of the large crops, year after year, on British farms, is the practice of working crops and livestock together and of changing the crops round every year so that the goodness of the land is never lost. It was the Saxons who introduced the first simple form of rotation farming into Britain 15 centuries ago. The Saxons were great farmers and their coming meant a big change in the pattern of the countryside. They used the three field system and the idea was to grow different crops in turn on each of the fields so that the soil should not get exhausted by one crop as had happened before. Outside each village there were three great fields which were cultivated in strips by the people of the village. Each year, one of the fields was planted with winter-sown wheat. Another grew spring corn and other spring-sown crops like peas or beans, while the third field was left idle for a season to rest the soil and allow the weeds to be destroyed. Much better crops were obtained by this three-field system, but it meant that one of the fields was wasted every year and no winter food was grown for the animals. With minor variations, this was the only rotation known to farmers all through the Middle Ages, and it provided enough food for the small rural population of those days. But from the 18th century onwards, the population was increasing rapidly in the towns, and more food was needed than farmers could produce by the old three-field system. Farmers met and discussed how methods could be improved and production increased. Some experimented in the breeding of livestock, and as a result, the standard and quality of farm animals was greatly improved. Others designed new implements. Jethro Tull's mechanical seed drill was the forerunner of those in use today. As interest in farming spread to the scientists and men of letters, books were written to expand the new theories. And through them and the new agricultural societies, farming knowledge steadily widened and grew. Moreover, Englishmen were beginning to travel abroad, where they were able to study the farming methods of other countries. It was in this way that clover was first introduced from Flanders by Sir Richard Weston. Since the creation of large farms by the enclosure of the common lands, the new landowning gentry were free to carry out experiments in the cultivation of their own estates. Lord Townsend, at his Norfolk home, established the use of turnips as a major farm crop. While his neighbor, Sir Thomas Cook, by his methods of soil improvement, turned his land from an unproductive waste, where two rabbits fought for every blade of grass, into a rich and prosperous farm. In the grounds at Holcombe Hall stands a monument to this pioneer farmer, one of the most enlightened landlords of his day, who devoted himself to the improvement of British farming and encouraged his tenants to do the same. As a result of all these experiments, these new implements, new animals, new plants and new methods, a new system of farming was evolved which came to be known as the Norfolk Four Course Rotation. Under this rotation, the sequence of crops on one field was like this. In the first year, the field grew wheat. In the second year, the field grew turnips. In the third year, the field grew barley. And in the fourth year, the field grew clover. While on a plan of four fields, the crops followed each other round every year like this. The grain crops, that's the wheat, barley or oats, were the sale crops. They brought money to the farmer, but they exhausted the soil, and they allowed the weeds to grow. But in the next year, the root crops made it possible to clear the ground of weeds by the earlier ploughing 
and by hoeing in between the rows of growing plants. And in the winter, they could be used for feeding the sheep and other farm animals. The clover crops then restored the fertility that the grain crops had taken out of the soil. In the summer, they were cut and made into hay, and this was fed to the cattle in the yards later on in the year when there wasn't enough grass to feed them on the pastures. In this way, each crop helped to provide the right conditions for the growth of the crop which followed it. Plenty of winter food was grown for the animals, and crops and livestock were brought together in a close and effective farming system. By this system, it was found that the same fields could be made to grow crops and feed livestock for an almost endless number of years. And it established the principle of rotation farming, which underlies all British agriculture today. Aye, and then another advantage it has, especially for the farmer, and that is it spreads the work and production more or less evenly over the whole year. I farm about 800 acres close under the Sussex Downs. And our yearly round goes something like this. Round about Michaelmas, that's about the end of September, as soon as we're finished with the corn harvest, I set some of the men to work ploughing up the fields for next year's crops. And ploughing, you might say, is the start of a new farming year. At the same time, I have other gangs at work lifting the last of the old year's crops. That's the potatoes, and the mangles, and turnips, and such like. store in the yard, where they'll be handy for feeding the cattle later on. Because by and by the grass will be getting short on the pastures, and then all the animals will have to go on winter rations. Kale's one of the crops we grow specially for the livestock. That's a great cabbage looking plant. And we feed it to the dairy cows out in the fields before they're brought into the sheds for the winter. With the sheep, it's different. They stop out all the year round. But between October and March, they'll be put to feed on the root crops. Now, that's one of the neatest tricks of this kind of mixed farming, because those sheep will be doing a useful job treading and manuring the soil as they fatten themselves on the turnips. By the middle of winter, all the cattle will have been brought in from the fields. And now they're fed on the mangles, grain and hay that we grew on the farm in the summer and stored away in the barns and yards during the autumn. Then the dung that collects in the cattle yards is taken and spread on the field. Always put back into the land as much as you take out of it. It's another kind of rotation. The land grows the crops, the crops feed the animals, the animals make the manure, and then the manure goes back into the land to keep it in good heart. Then some of the fields must be given a dressing of artificial manure. It's all according to the state of the soil and what the field's been used for last. And all through the winter, whenever there's time to spare from other jobs, the arrows and cultivators will be out, breaking down the topsoil and getting the seed beds ready for the spring sowing. It'll be about the middle of March when we start to sow the spring corn. You won't find dry weather for that. Then out come the drills, the seed boxes are filled up, and the sowing begins. As soon as the corn's all in, we have to start thinking about next year's hay crop. And here's another neat trick. The grass and clover seeds are sown in the fields of young oats and barley. A nurse crop, we call it, so that we'll get a cash crop of corn this summer, 
while the slower growing grasses are coming along to give us a good crop of hay next year. This time of year it's nearly all sowing and planted. After the corn and the clover, there's the potatoes to grow in. And after that, all the root and vegetable crops. Oh, I dare say it'll be well into March before we're through. Meanwhile, let's see what's been happening with the animals. One by one, those root fields will have been cleared by the sheep, till by the spring there's none left. But that don't matter, because by now there'll be enough new young grass on the pastures, and they can go down there to feed. will be put out to grass in the spring too. And by the middle of May, the nights will be warm enough for them to stop out altogether. That, of course, saves a lot of time and labor, bringing them their food and cleaning out the sheds. Which is just as well, because the hay will soon be fit to cut now, and then we'll all be busy with that, the first harvest of the year. be well into July before the hay harvest is finished, and by then, if all's gone well, we'll have enough of it cut and stacked to give us all we'll need for the livestock next winter. Now, all through the summer, those root crops that we sowed in the spring have been growing fast, and the weeds too. So from time to time, everyone has to turn to for a spell of hoeing and singling, and that's a job nobody likes. Tis teasing, tiresome work. It's got to be done and done now, or before we know where we are, we'll be into the corn harvest. Crown of the farming year. to tell you that this is the busiest season of the year for the farmer. No, there's no time off for any of us till the corn's all in. We're at it from dawn to dusk as long as the weather holds. And if that turns again us, then we just have to work harder than ever to catch up. Because somehow or another that corn harvest's got to be gathered in. And then come the tractors and the plows, the harrows and the cultivators and the yearly round begins all over again. The yearly round, that's the secret. To change the crops and to work crops and livestock together so that the goodness of the land is never lost. The modern farmer and skilled farm worker with the agricultural scientist and the engineer carry on the traditions of those early pioneers without whose energy and enterprise 
Britain's farmlands would not be able to yield the rich and increasing harvests that they do today. For 3,000 years, the fields and farms of Brazil that the soil should not get exhausted by one crop as it happened before. Outside each village, there were three great fields which were cultivated in strips by the people of the village. Each year, one of the fields was planted with winter-sown wheat. Another grew spring corn and other spring-sown crops like peas or beans, while the third field was left idle for a season to rest the soil and allow the weeds to be destroyed. Much better crops were obtained by this three-field system. British farms is the practice of working crops and livestock together and of changing the crops round every year so that the goodness of the land is never lost. It was the Saxons who introduced the first simple form of rotation farming into Britain 15 centuries ago. The Saxons were great farmers, and their coming meant a big change in the pattern of the countryside. They used the three field system, and the idea was to grow different crops in turn on each of the fields, but it meant that one of the fields was wasted every year, and no winter food was grown for the animals. With minor variations, this was the only rotation known to farmers all through the Middle Ages, and it provided enough food for the small rural population of those days. But from the 18th century onwards, the population was increasing rapidly in the towns. And more food was needed than farmers could produce by the old three-field system. Farmers met and discussed how methods could be improved and production increased. Some have been growing food. 3,000 years of continuous production and fertility. But Britain is a small country with a large population. And to get the maximum yield from his limited acres, the British farmer, through the centuries, has had to develop and practice the most intensive forms of cultivation. Machinery and science are at hand to help the modern farmer, but these are only aids to better farming. The secret of the large crops, year after year, on Britain.